Good morning, colleagues. Good morning, panel members. Um, we are gathered virtually to talk about leadership in times of crisis. School leadership in times of crisis. You would have seen that we are using the word crisis, which is a, a plural of the word crisis, because once COVID-19 arrives in the school context, you can expect a series of downstream crises. So that's why we are configuring it as crisis. It's not going to be one crisis. So um, I want to welcome all the people that are listening to this webinar. May I quickly introduce uh, the panel members. We have got uh, uh, a cocktail of panel members comprising of um, seasoned academics in the field of educational leadership. We have got uh, people that are seasoned in the field of school leadership. We have got people that are practicing school leadership and we have budding academics in the field of educational leadership. So it's quite uh, an exciting combination. We have in the panel, um, Professor Jan Haystek, who is director and research professor at the University of the Northwest. We also have Professor Kelly Grant, who is associate professor and head of the, the Department of Education in, in, at Rhodes University. We have uh, Dr. Permal Naika, who is a retired educationist, a writer, a motivational speaker, and a mentor. We also have Dr. Pingim Tembu, who is a lecturer in the School of Education, University of Pazul Natal. We have Dr. Novo, who is a principal of Lingeletu Primary School. And uh, we have uh, Professor Maringe, who is a professor of higher education and head of the uh, VITS School of Education. My name is uh, Vitalis Chikoko. I am uh, um, I am told that I must ad adjust my screen. Uh, my name is Vitalis Chikoko. I am a professor of educational leadership in the School of Education, UKZN. I want to welcome uh, colleagues from the UKZN, colleagues from my discipline, colleagues from uh, the School of Education and uh, the wider University of Pazov Natal. Welcome to all colleagues and uh, fellow educationists that have joined this uh, webinar. Um, I want to recognize uh, the head of school of uh, education, UKZN, uh, Professor Msibi. He is currently attending Senate, but he's going to join us anytime soon. Um, Professor Nina Amin was going to join us. She is the head of postgraduate and research in our School of Education, but she's committed in Senate. And um, so we can start. What is going to happen is that we will give our panel members five minutes to do their presentation. After that, we will then open for questions. So panel members, COVID-19 is here. Like we had in 2010, in 2010, we were, the, 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 the buzz phrase was, it is here feel it. Now, COVID-19 is here. Unfortunately, yes, we can feel it, but it's not exciting as 20, 2010. So, without much ado, I want to hand over to our first presenter, Professor Jan Haystek. Over to you, Prof. Thank you, uh, Professor Chikoko. Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity. And colleagues, this is a wonderful opportunity to share a few ideas. What I'm trying to do quickly, um, see if I can share my screen. Um, just for a moment, uh, people may, may don't know or want contact information, is that 
there is some contact information um, and telephone number and um, email address. Oh, I don't have that on the screen. I will get that later. But that is just who I am. Um, and then the what I want to talk about today is the leadership in this process, where we are at this stage. And for me, I for, first thought to look at just what does a crisis mean, or crisis, I mean, we have more than one. And I thought maybe sometimes we say very easily at our work, we have a crisis when a form is late or something like that is happening. But this is more, I would say, an actual real crisis where life and death is on the line. And we had something similar many years ago with the world wars and other parts of the world where we have this kind of crisis. So this is something different from the small things which we call sometimes in our life, work life, which is a crisis. So we have to address this differently. Something which is interesting, which I've seen is that people say that when we have a crisis, people are looking for leaders. They look for somebody to defend them or to work on their side or to take on the enemy, however you want to deal with it. So in that sense, leadership is essential in this time and in this process. So we have to look at that and make sure that we understand why do we have a person or a demand or a request for leadership. And then the leaders that are stepping forward, they are, which the history is telling us in time of crisis, sometimes they become the heroes, sometimes they become the villains. So to be a real leader at this stage at a high profile level, which I will discuss just now, is a real challenge. So in that sense, that is where I start from. Leaders are still accountable at this stage. Doesn't matter who they are accountable to, but there's accountability. We don't have enough time to go through that. But the problem is normally they have less time for decisions and the data which they need to work from and make the decisions are sometimes challenging. We see this now in our situation where our leaders must make a decision about school opening it. Is there enough data? Some say children doesn't get the virus. Some say there's a big problem with children and the leaders have to discern from this what do they make and how do they make a decision? I have one or two points of departures just quickly. First, the virus is not going to disappear. That's the first thing. We have to manage it. We have to manage ourselves and the situation. We have to take responsibility. There's a lot of claims that we are not living in a managed state, but the state mustn't tell us what to do. We have to take responsibility. So that's the balance between leading and let the people decide and maybe that is a kind of leadership. But it becomes nearly an impossible and unfair situation for the leaders because they nearly have to decide about between life and death. At the ground level, for example, the nurse or the doctor, if we actually take it like that, have to decide, will one patient get a, a ventilator or not? In education, it may not be that serious, but it is still there. So these are some of my point of departures. And then maybe one for education specifically and maybe a little bit more controversial, but that's why we're academics. Maybe they will investigate me also later about that because I want to put it on the table is to say we have to have no work, no pay because that is specifically applicable for teachers and education. And then the last thing which this virus emphasized before I really get to the leadership is it's emphasized that we have done a two-tier system, and it emphasizes in education, we know all about that, that we have a system with schools that have very good facilities and privilege, and most of our schools are not. And that has a huge implication for opening schools and the quality of education in which our leaders are supposed to make decisions about. So these are the two things. And then the next two-tier system which we have, which this virus emphasized, which I believe is playing a huge role in the kind of leadership we see, is that we have a government and a private sector. Government and the leaders in the government, which include union members and union leaders, they have the privilege of having their salary and their post secure, while the independent and private sector has a system where they can lose their work and lose their job. So 
Now leaders have to make a decision within all these situations, the background, do we open the schools or not? And I also want to put on the table, how do we understand the leadership? And one of the things is a theory, which is social identity. And I believe this is the background and how we have to read what our leaders are doing, is that social identity theory says, we have the people which we trust the most closest to us and we protect them and they are the people that we associate with and we think with them and they may help us to make decisions. That's why the president has a cabinet, but also a smaller group who help them. That's an example of that. My social identity determines who do I socialize with, who do I um, give preference to, and as part of that, we get the situation of reciprocal relationships. If you do something to me, I do something for you. That's background. But now my I see my five minutes, but basically up to tell us how I'm going to get to a conclusion about our leadership. Are they succeeding in education or not? It's very difficult for me to say bluntly they are succeeding or not, because it's such a big challenge. At this stage, there's a situation of opening the schools and the department is not able to do it. Are they just giving preference to in groups, to people that's close to them and that's the reason why they do that? The politics that's playing a role, where does the unions come in, their leadership? Do they really uh, play for education or do they have um, a background, which we are not sure why they are doing that? And our Department of Education, which find it very difficult to um, deliver what is expected of them. So my conclusion is our leadership is doing, especially the Minister of Education, doing their best, but the delivery and the challenges are too overwhelming. There's too much uncertainty for them to really make sure what they are saying and where we are going. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. There was a request along the way that uh, somebody wanted to see that uh, they get your slides uh, later on. Um, let us proceed to Professor Kelly Grant. Thanks, um, Professor Chikoko. Over to you, Prof. Grant. Can you hear me, Patalis? Yes. Perfect. Go ahead. Great. Good morning, listeners. Aside from my teaching and research in education, leadership, and management, I'm also the HOD of the Education Department at Rhodes. And in this presentation, I draw on my own leadership practices, which have had to abruptly adapt as a consequence of the COVID pand pandemic. Using the concepts of absence and presence, I will show how our daily ways of leading and managing, whether in schools or in universities, have altered, possibly irrevocably, and what this might mean for education leadership going forward. Currently, we are in a situation of vacant schools and universities with empty classrooms and staff rooms. There exists a void. Schools are silent, somewhat desolate. There's an absence of bodies, of energy, of relating, of passion, all so central to leading, teaching, and learning. We have an alternate presence with staff and students, limited through online technologies via Zoom, Google Classroom, or WhatsApp chats. But we're not connected to everyone. Issues of exclusion prevail. There are absences as a consequence of limited data and poor connectivity. And those who are present are not wholly present, as the images are distorted, disfigured, disjointed, they merely mug shot. And we have discordant sounds through Zoom technology or the wearing of masks. The school leaders are required to attend and lead multiple meetings, often reactive, emotional, with challenging purposes. 
And where we have teaching, it's disembodied with little spontaneity, absence of bodies, of movement, of energy. And many of us are experiencing Zoom fatigue in this unreal world. As of 1st of June, we are expected to return to our schools, which will not be normal. There will be a limited presence, reduced numbers of learners in grades seven and 12 with their teachers. An absence of learners whose parents have decided they should homeschool. An absence of teachers and SMT members who are either over 60 or have comorbidities. And as time passes, an absence of learners and teachers who become ill from the virus. A limited presence because of no after-school activities, social distancing and mask wearing. Fragmentation and loss are going to be heightened. We're going to have to resort to online teaching whilst also managing, or let me say juggling, face-to-face -face teaching. So what does this mean for school leadership? A huge emotional and psychological toll. Leading and motivating the staff and learners is likely going to become more difficult as the pandemic hits South Africa over the next few months. As the virus spreads, the absences will increase as school community members get sick and some die. And as leaders, we'll be called upon to take account of the whole person, prioritizing of staff and learners' personal well being, health, and psychological needs over their pedagogic needs. Pastoral and welfare care will be foregrounded and pedagogic care backgrounded. Our school leadership management training and mentoring programs do not unfortunately prepare us for this. So in conclusion, my recommendation to the DBE is that once the pragmatics of school reopening is in place, it is that serious attention must be given to the support that will be required of school leaders to cope with the emotional and psychological toll on the pandemic, of the pandemic in their schools. Now this creates opportunities for us as universities to work collaboratively with each other with schools and with our psychological and counseling departments to develop an appropriate short course for school leadership during the COVID-19 pandemic. There's also a need for school leader online counseling forum and networks to chat and support each other as we find a way forward through the pandemic. And finally, we will have no option but to draw on distributed approaches to leadership. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kelly Grant. We move on to Dr. Naika. Thank you, Professor. Um, just to lay out a context, we, I find the current um, education context a uh, very contradictory one. Um, we lock down with uh, those who are well to do, able to continue schooling, and uh, those who have nothing, whose education is stuck. Teachers were divided between the professional and the union lines. And uh, last night, when it was announced that um, schools in the Western Cape were closing after reopening, um, we feel a kind of panic um, with teachers, um, amongst parents school principals, and um, NGOs at the same time are challenging the reopening. There was a communique that I saw yesterday that said um, the department hasn't completed all the non-negotiables and therefore nobody should go back to school. So if we consider the, um, the response by the uh, DBE in preparation, it should have by now assisted parents, teachers, and the stakeholders to comprehend the situation. Um, the safety of the stakeholders is very important. As a start, an effective communication strategy between all the stakeholders is important. 
principals should have been thoroughly schooled in what was going on. Uh, sanitizing and uh, hygiene issues should have been sorted out. And the most important, psychosocial services should have been offered to schools. Um, but some of these uh, claims are that uh, these things are in place, but having spoken to a principal yesterday and some other colleagues, there are gaps in this. So when it comes on challenges, uh, when they return, uh, principal is going to dive in and try to catch up with the curriculum. And that's going to be dangerous because this is a time for dealing with mindsets. The lack of psychosocial services means it's an unnerving time. It's time for courageous leadership. Principals will have to step up and uh, it stands, it's stuck clear that everybody is looking for at the principle for leadership. The um, unions are demanding something, parents are something. Um, principles have become something of a piggy in the middle, if I could use that. So when they prepare, the main things that principals should be um, asking themselves is have they done a risk assessment? Have they charted um, a roadmap for steering through this course and emerging on the other side? And have they sent communications to parents to prepare children for the return? Have they been coached? These conflicting guidelines that are coming from news flashes um, about comorbidities um, and teachers in the 60s zone are adding to the anxiety. What happens? What happens if a principal is in that zone and um, there's a new leader appointed in the school? Will he manage or will he be able to handle the crisis? Uh, but when it comes some opportunities as well, the disrupted context brings opportunities. The, uh, the new person or even the existing person has a chance to make some radical systemic and institutional changes. Look beyond the recovery process. It's going to be difficult, but it can create improved systems um, for both quality and adaptability. And it is a time for courageous principles with a strong shared vision. Um, the principal in this time has a chance to allow his people, his team, to go along with him. And there's new ways to be able to do this. He can institute these things, like he doesn't need the morning briefing anymore. He could do it through a WhatsApp chat. Create banks of um, the online information available. And uh, practice the various um, aspects of teaching that we've cut out, like hygiene and right living, and um, the need to uh, communicate, um, that kind of thing. The, uh, the nature of the exit level assessments, in the light of what I just said, have to be rethought. Um, I think that schools um, should continue with the grade 12 and 7. Um, the number of classes should be reduced. There should be a rotation of teachers rather than students. And uh, at the same time, online teaching should continue. I think the basic uh, department of education should be considering four things in helping schools. Testing the antidotes, that's the social distance, distancing masks and all that. Assessing infection control, doing curriculum recovery in, uh, interventions, and the continuing school system, uh, the home schooling system. Going into the future, courageous leadership is required within the education system to reset it. Class sizes must be reduced. Maintenance cleanliness has to become the norm. Infrastructure must be restored. And all schools should be provided with admin and security services. Stakeholder mobilization is very important. And 
education can play a very important role in the future in mitigating disasters. To do this, it must have a strong and countable system in place through regular monitoring. Schools should receive capacity building in disaster management. It is clear that there's design flaws that need to be corrected if we are to make serious inroads into improving the quality and the inequality in the system that have been exposed. Fortunately, the country has effectively entered into a social compact in a way in which it is managing the COVID-19 epidemic. However, a state of recovery does not become a mere normalization of the current system. In conclusion, many rich and interesting lessons are emerging as we navigate these uncertain times. There is an obligation to repair and protect damaged infrastructure investing strictly into public-private partnerships, and provide courageous leadership from the top, supported by administrative stability and agility, and put technology in the hands of all learners, providing free data and national connectivity. We need a regulatory framework that protects and provides for the most vulnerable in our society. We need solutions that are not just technological in nature, we need leaders that can lead. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Naika. We we'll move on to Dr. Pingim Tembu. Dr. Mtembu, where are you? trying to connect to share the screen. Good day, everyone. Thank you, Chairperson, and also thank everyone, and especially the panel. I feel honored to be part of the panel. I'm, I, these people, like, the academics as well as the professionals, I, I, I think I'm go, I've learned and I'm still going to learn so much from them. Mine is going to add from what my other colleagues have alluded to. I'm saying it's good leadership in times of COVID-19 crisis. What can we learn? Okay, I would like to introduce my presentation by John Maxwell's quotes. John Maxwell is saying, crises do not make us, crises reveal us. Crises expose what is already there. Choices make us, but crises reveal us. As we go along with the presentation, it will become a little bit clearer as to why I feel this quote is very important for my presentation. My contribution towards the panel to this video is on... Can you assist me? I don't know what is happening. What do you want to do? I keep on receiving the echo. Okay, if we look at this picture, as we can see now we have entered a space whereby what the talk of the day when it comes to education, you talk of online teaching, online teaching. Yet there are realities that we need to be mindful of. As you can see this picture, everyone here is expected to learn online due to lockdown. But for some, it's easier. For others, it's a little bit difficult. But for some, it's impossible. 
questions that good leaders maybe need to tackle or to ask themselves is, as we navigate towards this unknown future, can we perhaps find any silver lining that might present opportunities to innovate and create in ways that we might not have been able to if there was no COVID-19? How can we come out stronger beyond this crisis that we are facing at the moment? More so, can teachers ensure, how can teachers ensure that their learners are safe, have a meal, understanding socioeconomic issues in South Africa, and they learn under these undesirable circumstances, whereby teachers are like nurses. They become frontliners in ensuring that learners feel safe. And while we do that, the important, important is we need to be realistic about the current situation. <laughs> okay, in front of me, I've got, I mean, few pictures. In these pictures, as you can see, This one, for an example, it shows and it depicts the reality in South Africa, whereby we have those who have and those who do not have being divided by one road. And during lockdown, it is clear to everyone that these ones on the side of the road, even as we speak, they are continue to continuing learning. While these ones are just locked down, they can't do anything. These are the realities that South Africa is facing. This picture was taken this year in January. We talk of social distancing. In this particular context, in this classroom, how can we ensure that there is that social distancing? And what we need also need to think of is the reconceptualization or rethinking about the school. When we talk of school, what do we mean when we talk of school? Are we, talk, are, we, are, we, are we referring to school as a building that is just closed? Or rather, we need to shift our thinking now, whereby we, we look at schooling. Whereby schooling, in this particular instance, whereby there had been a lockdown, most schools were closed. With schooling closing for those schools. While for, other, for some, while school, schools were closed, but schooling continued because they have access to online learning. We need to think of creative ways and adaptive ways of dealing with all these complexities. But I'm going to use Hayfet and, and, and Linsky, who speak to the issue of leadership. They are saying leadership cannot just be seen as being solely on the leader, as Prof in, in indicated earlier on. Le leadership for them is an action, is what you do. But for you to be able to, to do leadership, you need to understand the current realities. What are the realities? By not being delusional, by not being selective, then what, what is that we want to achieve? Then, what is in between then becomes leadership. Understanding reality while knowing full well where you want to go. What is it that you aspire? Okay, Dr. Mtembu, can I ask you to, to give us your, 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 your last, just your last words? Uh, we are desperately running out of time. <laughs> okay, that's fine. So what I'm going to do now I'm going to present this slide. While I was on Twitter, it was interesting how teachers were engaging. Wayne posted this, and, she, and, he, and he said, students have to mass law before they can bloom. It then made me think really, that at the moment, we are stuck whereby we, we can't even deal with security, with prosperity with social issues and physiological issues. How can we then move to bloom, to teaching and learning if we are still stuck here at the bottom? 
And I'm saying to conclude, with this crisis, national and provincial leaders, as much as they are trying their best to offer solution, but the problem becomes clear whereby they cannot cater for all contexts and eventualities. And this could create more undesirable problems because solutions may not be agreeable to everyone, neither applicable to every context, nor consider many variables and stakeholders in the system. Then I suggest that national departments together with the provincial department, now that they have been having these challenges, I believe that they need to give power back to those at the call phase principals, teachers, SMTs, and SGPs with the support of the district because they are the ones who understand these issues more clear and who can be able to adapt and offer solutions. But these departments, they need to offer support financially and in terms of the resources for the schools to be able to adapt mm -hmm. to Thank you very children. much. Thank you very much, this, Dr. This, this question is too complex and unpredictable to come up with complete solutions that will cater for all diverse contexts. My suggestion is that this crisis needs everyone to come together and offer workable solutions and flexibility. But, but while doing that, education system needs to see this as an opportunity to deal with a deep-rooted inequalities that still persist. Such unprecedented unprecedented complexities and uncertainties need bottom-up, solution-oriented approach and not details from above. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mtembu. Um, you can see that uh, the, this is a massive topic uh, and uh, presenters are loaded with issues. There is a question that, that was thrown to say our uh, 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 listeners going to get to these presentations. The answer is yes they can be posted to everyone who is interested. Uh, let's move on to uh, Dr. Ngobo. Thank you, Prof. Um, I, I'm gonna be focusing on this thing, on my position as the principal of the school. Right. Uh, I, I'm going to be talking on the school leadership during the COVID-19 era. There are quite some challenges regarding um, that are, are due to this um, to the mushrooming of this uh, COVID-19. One, infrastructure. Um, other schools do not have enough classrooms. The department suggests to reduce the number of learners in, uh, in classrooms to accommodate the social distance. Some schools were already overcrowded prior to COVID-19. So in order to implement the recommendations, more classrooms will be needed. And then they recommend, uh, the department uh, recommends that, uh, oh, some of the demands are that um, learners will be expected to, do, uh, to wash um, their hands frequently there are some schools that do not have water. So the department will have to provide schools with water together with the other sister departments. In terms of human resources and physical resources, the decrease in class size will mean more teachers are needed to teach those extra new classes. Social distancing requires a meter between people and that poses a challenge in schools because the majority of the schools use combination days which are not even a meter long and that will mean one learner, one desk if we are to ensure social distancing. That means we do not have adequate furniture in our schools to accommodate uh, those demands. More books are required since learners cannot share books anymore due to this COVID-19. So the department will, I mean, like the Department of Education will have to provide schools with more resources. Even schools themselves will have to make sure that they follow or adhere to their retrieval policies to make sure that the learners do bring the books at the end of the year. So that in the following year, they'll have adequate uh, textbooks 
to avoid uh, to avoid them to sharing uh, books. We then called for a financial implication, um, Amam. We also have a, a, a crisis when it comes to finance. Amma basic um, allocation to schools that are used for maintenance takes time to be transferred to schools. As we speak, as we speak, funds have not been transferred to schools. So in order for schools to be kept tidy all the time, uh, the department will have to make sure that funds are transferred to schools account on time so that schools can be kept tidy all the time. Uh, one of the um, new things that will have to be in place when the schools resume in June, it's this curriculum um, pruning. They said there's going to be, a, 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 the, there will be a, the department will have to prune some parts of the curriculum. But at this point in time, it is not clear as to which part will be pulled out when the teachers resume on Monday. So it has to be clear as to where, which part will have to be sifted out. So what does this mean? Um, um, what does this mean for us as a, a, a school? Yes, the department has promised to respond promptly to a number of COVID-19 demands. This embrace, but this should continue even post uh, COVID-19 era because it shows that this needs to be in place um, throughout. Then the department is also planning to appoint AMA health personnel and general workers for schools during this um, period. That is appreciated, but it should continue even in the post COVID-19 era. And all schools with water every day, but then there are schools that do not have water tanks as we speak. So it, water tanks will have to be supplied to school and water will also have to be supplied on daily basis in order for this thing for, 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 for our learners to be on the safe side or healthier even uh, uh, during this period. And then, we all, uh, digital funding will also be appreciated to procure more textbook and uh, more furniture for our learners. Looking at the way forward now, um, what is it that we can do as South Africa? As much as everyone would like to see learners going back to school, but our environment has to be safe for our learners to come back to, to school. Yes, the exit grade in both primary and secondary schools um, can be brought, uh, they can be sent back to school, but only if healthy measures have been put in place in schools. That is the role of the leadership in schools to ensure that uh, learners are safe all the time. Right, Dr. the please. Dr. Novo, please give me your last sentence. We're saying the exit, okay. Your party. We're saying short? schools need a number of resources. Sorry. Yes, Prof. Yeah, just give me your, your last words so that uh, we, we, we want to leave some space for questions and answers. Okay. We're saying schools need a number of resources as we speak, furniture. This indicates that we need to have surplus of resources so that we'll be able to face, uh, to face a sub, because it, it doesn't mean that this is the last time a, a natural disaster attacks in our society. So that says to us, we need to be prepared. We need to have, to have something in reserves so that should this, should this happen in future, we're ready to face it. Thanks. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ngovo. Uh, we move on uh, to Professor Maringe. <clears throat> Thank you very much indeed, uh, Professor Chikoko. Good morning, colleagues. It's a privilege and honor to have been invited to share a few thoughts about the next episode of our journeys as school leaders. A very important question, which is, how can we come out stronger out of this? 
and Kali has also the fact that uh, we are in a of attempting to make a transition to what she refers to as a presence back in the schools from an absence that has been occasioned by uh, the COVID-19. So I'm here to share with you some of the things that will enable us as leaders to look into the future content that nothing else can prepare resilient leaders. The purpose of my presentation is to share snippets about resilient leadership. And I'll start with a quotation from Gratians, who is probably one of the uh, foremost scholars in the area of resilient leadership. And he wrote in 2015, and I'm quoting, of all the virtues we can learn, no trait is more useful, more essential for survival, and more likely to improve the quality of life than the ability to transform adversity into an enjoyable challenge. So that's where we are right now. We are in the midst of, a, uh, of adversity, uh, but we would like to make a transition to a more prosperous future. I define resilience as the capacity of an organization, of an entity or an individual to cope with disruption, but more importantly, to attain higher levels of productivity and fulfillment. But why is resilient leadership going to be important for us as school leaders going forward? A lot of research tells us that schools that are referred to as resilient schools or leaders that are referred to as resilient leaders tend to provide certain benefits to their school environments. The first one is that they have got an inherent capacity to negotiate crisis. They usually come out with better outcomes for their learners. They are also more trusted by parents and learners, more trusted by government, uh, government departments, and they tend to attract high caliber uh, students and staff. And also they, have, they tend to enjoy better staff stability and uh, they have limited educational wastage and they also have got a very, very strong futuristic appeal. So what I would like to share with you are just four fundamental elements of this thing here that I'm referring to as a resilient leadership. The four elements of resilient leadership from the literature tells us that they are, we have the first level being what is referred to as the responsive, a responsive capacity, turning our schools to institutions that have got a responsive capacity. And by this, I, um, I mean that our schools need to have some form of readiness for a rapid response. The second capacity that is required in a resilient leadership is adoptive capacity, which is simply a readiness reliable measures in order to overcome. The third is what is referred as adaptive responses within the context in which our schools um, are to be found. And the last capacity required in terms of development of a resilient school by resilient leaders is what is referred to as transformative capacity. That is a readiness for our schools to predict and to be prepared to deal with a future crisis. I'll end with uh, perhaps just six dimensions for us to be able to think about as we go back into our schools. Uh, six dimensions of uh, effective, uh, resilient leaders. First one is that resilient leaders are not going to wait for crisis to happen again. They will now start to develop a capacity to anticipate. And I think uh, Vitalis has already told us that that's why we are calling this uh, session here crisis rather than crisis. But they also, number two, prepare and empower multiple levels of distributed leadership across and beyond the school. They maintain effective school readiness plans for crisis. 
Number four, they develop school, uh, uh, they develop the school across the four levels of the resilient capacity, which I've already talked about. But they also integrate crisis disaster management into the school curriculum. Now, this is important. And I know that we've got a huge problem of our national curriculum. But to some extent, I think we've got to start thinking about you know, integrating uh, disaster management into our school curriculum. But they also maintain crisis and disaster budgets as basic resources for anticipated crisis. So colleagues, my concluding statement is that as we return to our schools and as we bring back what Kali Grant has referred to as a presence, and as we imagine ways of emerging stronger, as Pinky was talking about, I think that the resilience framework can help us get there. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Marinke. The need for accountability, the need to manage ourselves, the need for emotional management, the need for psychosocial attention, the need to be courageous, the need to be adaptive, the need to be resilient, the need to look at the resources that are necessary for schools to to start. These are some of the things that are coming through and you can see that uh, there are many, many issues. We have got 20, about 20 questions that are coming. Um, we will not be able to address all of them. We only have um, a few minutes to go, but um, we will attempt some. My suggestion is going to be that uh, those that we are not able to, um, to attend to, we can ask them to be sent to us and I'll ask the panel as a community service on our part and as academics, it's our, our job to be able to contribute some knowledge to some of these things. We can uh, communicate beyond this webinar. So let's see if we can um, look at some of the questions. And uh, panel members, you can pick up any one of the questions that I'll just throw to you. The Minister of Basic Education says that the reopening of schools is based on some research that school children are likely not to return to school if they stay longer out of school. Is there evidence that suggests this? Well, the, the health questions are going to be difficult for us. There is still confusion and no clear guidelines received on how to handle over 60 staff and those with COVID. Um, I think the question I wanted to say, comorbidities. Um, here's another one. Um, to what extent are leaders in public schools better able to manage the crisis than in the private schools? Is there something that leadership in private schools may learn from the public schools. One of the speakers referred to institutions starting by doing a risk assessment. Can the speaker briefly elaborate, elaborate on uh, this point? I think uh, Dr. Naika, this, is, this will be yours. If you could advise the minister, when would be the right time to reopen schools? Uh, let me end there so that it's not an overload. Uh, Dr. Naika, would you like to start with the issue about risk assessment? Yes. Um, if I may go. Uh, I, I was saying the danger is when students barge into schools and start the process of curriculum catch up. The, the first thing that should be done is to find out in every aspect of the teaching and learning and the operation of the school, they need to find out how best can we prevent the infection from spreading. For example, handing uh, exercise books to children and collecting, signing the register. That is why I said the morning briefing meeting to prevent uh, contact between large numbers of people in the staff room it could be done through the WhatsApp chat, not to do away with it, but just for the lockdown period. So in each sector of the school, what about passing? 
find out how they can redo the system of um, passing, one-way passing, where children, if they come to the office, for example, do not have to go back in the same direction. These are the areas, if they get together as a team and consider, how do we handle each of these areas? So you are doing a risk assessment and you're organizing. From Out of that would come a roadmap. Just to allow more time, I'd let me stop there. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, panel members, uh, do you want to tackle any of the questions I, throw, I threw to you? Tell us, can I just if they maybe when open when to open the schools, what do you recommend and how what do you get advice do you give to the minister? I mean, that is what I'm was trying to say that it is a nearly impossible balance to have an answer which will satisfy everybody. So it is difficult to say on the one hand, people say you're going to send our children to their death. On the other hand, people say we have to support them. But what I haven't heard really in our discussions is that what it will happen if we don't open the schools. Jonathan Jansen said, Professor Jonathan Jansen said that we must leave and just promote everybody to next year. But what are the consequences? How are we going to do that if our teachers at this stage are seemingly not able to really deal with the curriculum of one year if we look at the reading and um, mathematics um, results and quality. So my answer will be do it as soon as possible within all the regulations um, and all the sanity and the distances that need to be kept, but get the teachers, get the community involved. Um, there's enough evidence that they can help with their sanitization and everything. So I would say open the schools, um, most of our children are not in a uh, ability to have technology and get their teaching. So they are going to lose out the most. Thank you very much. Uh, so, you talked about the two tire system in, in education and, uh, and, and that's a, a, a huge one. Colleagues, we have been given um, 15 more minutes Beyond uh, 12 o'clock, I hope that uh, panel members will be able to be pre present. I think they saw the massiveness of the issues we are discussing and uh, the massiveness of the questions that are coming through. Panel members, do you have, uh, does anyone have uh, a response to some of the questions I raised, Kelly? Thanks, Vitalis. Um, I think in just my own experience with your que the question around um, staff over 60 and staff with comorbidities. In our departments, um, we've people have the option ready. So we've got a number of staff members who are very keen to get back into their offices and back to their work. They feel well, they feel healthy, they still feel young. Um, so that in terms of age, I think individuals should be allowed to choose. Um, and certainly it works in the academy. I'm not sure about schools. But, um, and then also just as a, as a department head to invite um, staff confidentially to speak about their comorbidities, what they, their risks are, and then if they feel they do not want to be put at risk by doing face-to-face -face teaching is for us to support them through online teaching during this period. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Grant. The question of uh, comorbidities is, is, is huge. Uh, on a lighter note, I, I have uh, health comorbidities, but fortunately, I don't have any <laughs> academic comorbidities, so I can still uh, operate quite well with my work. Thank you very much, Prof. Grant. Um, does uh, anybody want to respond to the other questions? Uh, Dr. Ntembu, Dr. Ngobo, um, Dr. Naika, I see you raising your hand. Yes, there was a question about uh, what, what can public schools, what can the experience in public schools teach private schools? I think there's a very important 
That's a good question. Uh, public schools reach out to those in the lowest rung. The, the extreme end of the spectrum, the poorest of the poor. And the challenge to communicate with them in this period was extreme. Um, they don't have data. Um, and uh, they were finding creative ways to reach out to parents, to send homework, and to try and get children to engage. Um, and they were also finding out that uh, children were becoming stressful because they depended on being in school um, for their emotional well-being. So those schools that deal with the poorest of the poor have a lot to offer the private schools who probably have uh, those children who are able to earn such um, education at these schools. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Naika. Any, are there any responses that uh, you would like to give? Uh, Dr. Mtembu, would you, do you have any response to the questions posed yet? Okay, maybe I can have a, a, just a general response to some of the questions. Because what seems to be coming up here is that these challenges that schools, principals, teachers are faced with are very complex. And this goes back as well to the point that I made earlier on during my presentation, that Department of Education, in as much as they could be able to, they could try in addressing all these issues. But looking at the localities and uh, uh, I mean, at the individual context, it may not be that easy for them to be able to resolve all these problems. I believe that if they could just give power back to the principals, principals are frustrated. I have had some conversations with some of the principals. They feel so helpless. They wish they could do something in trying to address some of the challenges. But because the department, they impose some of the solutions that just are not workable. Like for an example, there are two schools, two kilometers from each other. One has less learners, the school is like nearly empty. Two kilometers down the line, the school is so packed. These two schools in the same context, in as much as they have challenges, but their challenges are very unique. Then how can we then try as the principals of schools work around those challenges as individuals, but with the support from the district. The issue of schools with 60 teachers, for an example, only grade 12 is coming to school. What about the rest of the teachers? How can they be, be kept accommodated? Can the school try and come up with some ways of keeping them occupied? Maybe this is the time where we, don't, we only not focus on grade 12. We look at the future. Why can't we use these spaces, these spaces of engaging, of having professional learning communities, working together in trying to enhance our instructional practices? What can we do in the meantime in trying to make sure that with the challenges that we are facing, we can in the near future be able to address these challenges by using this particular time in trying to develop ourselves and share expertise and share practices even sharing resources if it is possible. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mtembu. School leaders cannot be, school leadership cannot be business as usual. It calls for reimagining leadership, it calls for rethinking the structural and cultural arrangement in schools. Unfortunately, school principals have not been capacitated on leading in times of crisis. Rather, they have been reduced to debonairs and McDonald's delivery personnel to fetch and deliver PPEs. And the views of the panel on school leader self-capacitation in the context of this pandemic and how can this be done? Uh, that's one question. It seems that no one is really monitoring what schools can or cannot do. Some schools have a lot of structures and procedures in place, others not. Taking contextual factors into account, thermometers, malfunctioning, social distance not adhered to. At times, it seems that everyone wants to comply with what the WCED wants, 
So no reports going through on this to look good. What can be done? Um, I don't know whether this is a question. I like what Jan indicated as the importance of social identity. However, I miss the importance of professional identity, which competes with the social identity. In other words, I'm suggesting a new identity that combines the two identities as personal identity. That, that's a contribution, but panel members, you can, uh, you can still, um, you can still add to that. Among other things, the COVID-19 predicament seems to have robbed us of educational leaders as they have abruptly shifted to follower identity. If SGBs, teacher leaders, SMTs, principals, circuit managers, union executives, among others, could return to their leadership roles and join the government, we can face this crisis. How can an invitation of this nature be sent? Uh, I think the sentiment here is that uh, leadership is not there anymore. We saw another sentiment there to say they have become um, something else and not leaders. I've, I think panel members, maybe you can uh, comment on that. Let's um, not overload it too much. Let's just come back to our panel and see if we can get a, a couple of comments from uh, what is coming through. Any takers? Um, Vitalis, can I respond to one or two of them? Yes. It is really interesting what the people said and they have different views. And as I see somewhere, somebody said we need another session or two about this and I hope we can do something like this. And uh, maybe you can arrange for something for us again. But about uh, Inba, who said that principles have become delivery um, and uh, they're not leaders. To a certain extent, I agree because um, we are treating them like that instead that we leave them or help them to lead because leaders have to take responsibility and they are taking us somewhere new with a vision. And if the vision is strong enough, people will follow. But I have an opinion that many of our principals are just post occupiers. They're not really leaders. They have been appointed because they were the only one available or for some other reasons. So we really need to look at what do we expect from these people and what we want. But at this stage, I really think some of them can do a great job if the department is just leaving them and the local community can work with the local situation. I've heard examples of wonderful work that's been done where parents and everybody is getting involved and the teachers against some of the union's recommendations that teachers must not get involved. Um, they can do it. And I believe the people who are at the head of the schools, most of them, if you leave them, they can be enough of a leadership to take us to the next level. Thank you very much, Jan. So the, the mother question is the resilience there. Of course, we know resilience can be built uh, as time goes on, but how much is there already? Uh, Dr. Grant? Sorry, Professor Kelly Grant? Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm just picking up on two points. Inba's point, I absolutely agree. It cannot be business as usual. And I think this is a very exciting time for school leadership. And here I'm meeting leadership in the sense of innovation and change as opposed to um, being the um, just implementers of policy and followers. Um, so I think there's a real opportunity um, but I do think we should be seeing leadership as a collective. That was one of the questions on, on the chat as well. That there's the space and um, one has to respond very quickly. And I would disagree with the comment made about Fulan saying change needs 10 years and change is slow. I think, yes, um, we can't expect change to happen quickly, but in a, in a context such as this, virus, we cannot delay. We have to respond immediately. So as um, was said earlier, we need to take risks. This is a risk-taking time. 
And it's a time of a distributed model where anybody who shows expertise and potential should be drawn into a much broader leadership collective. So if a parent is out there who has some skill and can contribute to that community, we should be drawing on that. And the same with teachers. For example, often it's the really young teachers who have expertise in online technologies and stuff that us older people have no clue about and are not really interested in. So just to find expertise and draw on it and move very quickly um, to create something new. So I'm, I would argue that it's a time for opportunity. And if one is working from a theory of chat, we're interested here in learning what is not yet there. None of us know the answers um, to this problem. So the opportunity for any ideas, um, taking risks, trying something out, and flattening the hierarchy that has been so often linked to school leadership. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think what, what you say there, Prof, uh, resonates with what the Silva has said here to say principals alone don't have the ability to run schools. We need to, to work together as a team. Any, any responses, Dr. Naika? Please, please uh, unmute. Yes. yes. OK. I, I just want to respond to the question about self-capacitation and um, uh, extend what Professor Grant um, has just said. She's covered some of it in uh, her response. But this is the time, um, as she said, uh, for distributed leadership, flattening the hierarchy. It's a time for the younger staff to come into the fold in more creative ways. They are going to be many senior leaders who have to leave the school, whether they have, um, uh, whether they would like to stay or not. Um, uh, legislation is going to make them leave in a short while. The younger people have a chance to reimagine the future. What would the school look like come the end of the lockdown? Or it is the time for them to develop a model for what they wanted to see as a school. If the bureaucracy prevented them from coming in and suggesting ideas and making things happen, now is the time. So when we talk about um, self-capacitation, simple um, uh, suggestions and meetings about new ways to deal with old protocols. Uh, how do we go about um, handling um, online um, distribution of material? How do we start bringing in parents? We have parents now who've come, uh, come to schools in big numbers. Now is the time to capture those parents. And you don't need to go anywhere else to capacitate yourself on uh, uh, doing such things. What did you do to bring those parents? I coach a group of principals and I've seen in this lockdown period, some of my guys doing wonderful work bringing parents on board. Um, distributing uh, homework and uh, even um, other materials to remote areas. You know, uh, Portugal had a wonderful um, method this, uh, this, this period. They used the post office to distribute um, material to central places even in remote areas. And these are the things we can reimagine going into the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any contributions? We we are almost there now in terms of the 15 minutes we gave, but we were given. But let me check if there is any any other responses. Um, yes. Okay. Can I respond, yes, Prof? Yes, Dr. Novo. Yes, Prof. There is a lesson that I've learned uh, with our education system. Um, if you don't capacitate yourself, you end up not getting a lot of things. You miss out a lot if you don't capacitate uh, yourself. That means even in this era, principals, leaders, or whoever, whoever it is, will have to capacitate himself or herself in order to, uh, to, to move uh, forward. Uh, recently, we've experienced that as a, a, 
as educational leaders, especially in schools. We've had uh, this material from different sacred offices, and yet that was not uh, the thing. That, that was not our role to do, to, to do that. But because we wanted to have that material in our schools, we had to go and collect the material. So you just offer yourself in order for yourself to to move forward in your in your role. Two, we came back with uh, some instruments or equipment that we'll use during this uh, period. Equipments like um, a thermometer. So nobody has taught us as to how to use the thermometer. You just learn along the way how to use the equipment. So if you do not take that risk to teach yourself, you will end up not using whatever you will have if you wait to be taught by any other person. We came back with um, sanitizers, uh, the disinfectants, and nobody told, uh, or told us or taught us how to use them. So we had to look at the, at the chemical itself, its chemicals. We looked at the chemical, the containers, and we had to, to teach those people that are using that as to how to use, uh, use them. So in this, um, it's very, the human resource is too limited in our department. The only way to survive is to teach yourself so that you are able to help the people that you work with. Thanks, Prof. Thank you very much. I think those words uh, uh, will uh, resonate with uh, my parting shot to say, I think what we are seeing now is uh, different types of leaders, um, some that are waiting there and using phrases such as, we don't know, we are waiting, the department must give us X, Y, Z. That's one cluster of people. And then you have another that will say, we want to take it upon ourselves to contribute solutions to what the department is doing. And uh, it also, I, I, I saw one question here that says, why, why should uh, the department buy masks for, uh, for teachers and everyone else? Um, without wanting to, to answer that question directly, but what we are finding in research is that schools that tend to succeed even in disadvantaged circumstances are those schools that take it upon themselves to say, we have capacity, we can do this. And this is the resilience that uh, Professor Marinke was referring to. Uh, colleagues, I uh, know that we are already past the 15 minutes we were given. Uh, I'm going to try to ask for a second webinar on, on this. It's a, it's a huge matter, it's a massive matter. I'm going also to try and bring together all the questions that we have not been able to address. And uh, if we get a second chance for a second webinar, I would like us to start with those questions and move forward. So on that note, I want to thank you very much, uh, panel members, for being present and for the very useful contributions that you have provided. I think they are food for thought. I think they are very helpful going forward. And uh, I want to thank the people that have been listening and those that have thrown in questions. We want to see if we can uh, proceed from there. We are obviously going to make use of those questions. So on that note, uh, thank you very much. Bye. Thank, thank you, you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye.